Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this month's Hump Day Hangout with the uh, International Society of Fire Service Instructors. Happy to be here this month. Uh, we got a, a great cast of uh, fire service professionals. We're going to talk today about some uh, some relevant topics of fire service company level training, uh, which is, you know, in my opinion, the foundation of which we build all our training off of. Um, on behalf of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, we'd like to go ahead and take a second and remember Chief Bobby Halton, who passed away uh, a little over a month ago, um, you know, a foundational name in the fire service for all of us, um, the, the star of uh, FDIC and, you know, the editor-in-chief of fire engineering, um, influenced on, I think, everybody on this panel, uh, one way or another, um, affected our careers and our abilities to do what we're doing today. So um, thanks for all he's done. I know he will not be forgotten. Um, in the same breath, I'd like to welcome Chief David Rhodes. You uh, as the new editor in chief of fire engineering, um, I think the great things will be coming with Chief Rhodes in this new position with him. Um, and so they're excited about that and the partnership that we will have with uh, fire engineering, Clarion, and the Inter Society of Fire Service Instructors moving forward. So uh, we're a little over two months away from uh, FDIC. So make sure you guys, if you have not got registered yet, make sure you register soon. Uh, the hands on training classes are filling up quickly. Um, there's a ton of uh, pre-conference courses that are going to be awesome classroom sessions. Got some people on this call that are doing some classroom sessions and some training there. So uh, make sure you guys get registered for it. It's a great week of fire service training, fire service networking, and an expedition that can't be beat. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention, please submit articles. Um, fire engineering is always looking for new submissions on articles. So if you have an idea, a fire, even if, you know, last rotation, last month, your company got called out to a fire and you just thought, man, something was weird, or you just want to talk about it, write an article about it, put your thoughts into words. Um, I think uh, most people think they're not an author. And when they start writing, they realize it's not as hard as they once think, thought. So get your articles in. Uh, fire engineering um, would love to have them. Um, so make sure you're out there, uh, you know, capturing your thoughts and words and submitting it. The worst they can say is no, and, and there's a great chance they might say yes. And the next thing you know, a couple articles later, you're teaching at FDIC like uh, many of us on this call. So um, with that said, we'll jump right into it. Like I said, we got a great cast today. Today, we're going to talk about uh, company level training and the importance of company level training and kind of what it looks like um, for today's fire service. So We'll start um, kind of what constitutes company level training and, and just get some perspectives from the uh, from the group. So we'll start with uh, Chief Heller, retired Chief Heller. What what do you think about company level training and kind of what constitutes good company level training? Well, uh, thanks. Number one, thanks for having having me on. And um, you know, can't can't say enough about Bobby O'Halt and giving us this opportunity. And and uh, certainly the the prayers go out. Uh, still to, to Bobby's family and to those affected. Um, so with with that, um, it's the backbone of the fire service, in my opinion. It really is. Uh, I can tell you when I moved from a captain to a chief, I missed the company level training a lot. Um, and I did my damnedest to get out with the guys in my in my district to make sure that that uh, I was seeing what they were doing and, and giving a little input and just learning from them as well. Uh, I think the best part about company level training is if you've got number one, if you've got a crew that's dialed in and want to do it, that's fantastic. If you've got a company officer who demands it, that's important. Uh, a lot of times the company officer, it, it may be not, not that guy that's the fire brand pushing it and the, and the firefighters are, and that's okay too, as long as everybody's participating, but it's the company level training is the most important stuff that we could get out there. I, I believed when I was a boss and even when I was a fireman that I felt the key was we had to recognize what we did, what we were expected to do, what we may have to do, even if it was the, the uh, um, low frequency, high risk type stuff. We had to address it and we had to determine how we were going to tackle it based on obviously based on the orders from up above. But we had to know our place in it. And the more we drilled and the more we trained, the, the more comfortable I became when I was a fireman and then as a chauffeur and then as a captain, it just, it's those foundational blocks. And I, you know, we can send them out of proby school and shoot them out to companies, but what happens at the company at that company level is what is going to make or break a lot of firefighters careers. 
And uh, I, I can tell you a lot of stories. I've got a good friend who's on the job and, and uh, she told me straight up, she goes, I love the job. I love everything I do. And she's hardcore, great firefighter yet is with a crew that has no interest in doing their jobs when it comes to training and it's killing her because she knows that's the foundational point she needs the worst. So um, that, that's where I'm at with it. It is, it's head and shoulders above anything headquarters sends down in my opinion. And, and I was at headquarters sending stuff down for you know a long time. <laughs> um, but now I, I would take what that captain told me over, over a lot of things, you know, I know we all have to do bloodborne and we all have to do everything else that we have to do. But for the most part, we work a 24 or we work a 48 or whatever it is. Somewhere in there, there's plenty of time to get some really good company level training in. So that's that's my soapbox. <laughs> no, I, I I don't I don't disagree with any one part of that. I, you know, it's fantastic. I, I I I see companies that train together and you can see that training uh translate into other things right you, you, because if they're doing company level training and they're eating dinners and meals together then they're going they're working out together and and they're gelling uh on other aspects of it and i think that's just you know the the, the correlation associated with it so chief simmons from the great city of oakland what's your thoughts on some company level training good question so first of all chief heller i want to commend you as when you made the transition from company officer chief officer you still continue to engage in training and education with your personnel what I would say, uh, what I would say in that case, the young lady who's who's having some difficulties with her crew not wanting to train is that you, as the company officer, you dictate and control the shift. When I was a company officer, I called it the two twenty two rule. You give me two hours of training a day, and I'll give you twenty two hours unless the citizens call. Company officer training is the backbone when we talk about safety wellness, health, and proficiency, it all results from training and education. One of the things that I, uh, as a company officer, and I still emphasize today is train on things that are associated with your district. I spent 10 years working downtown as a lieutenant and a captain at Station One downtown area. A lot of our training and education revolved around what was in our district. We had high rise, we have high rise buildings, we have a subway. We have a port, we have a waterway, we have hazmats, we have commercial, we have mid-rises, we have residential. Based on what was in my district, that's how I set up training and education. But most importantly, I included the crew. And what I would do, and part of, a psych part of it is psychology, because we know as firefighters, we like to complain a lot. Well, the cap, the cap has us doing this drill. So each month I would ask, I would ask the firefighters, what drills are we going to do this week? I mean, this month, and what drills would you like to take a lead on? So that way, I took away that statement that Captain Simmons, Lieutenant Simmons, is always um, dictating what we do and, and, and on what we don't do. So involve your crew in regards to training and education. But I can't overemphasize what you just said, Chief Heller, in regards to training and education at the company level being the backbone. And closing this out, it doesn't cost us anything financially. And the fire chief, he or she is not gonna complain because we're out there in the community engaging in training and education with our personnel. 100% agree. It's a, uh, I think, you know, we've heard it twice now in, in this a short time, the backbone, you know, and I think that's true, it's the backbone backbone for success on the fire ground, but, you know, we, we got a comment from Amanda Miller talking about how it, you know, builds trust in the companies. And I, I, I could not agree more. It's, you know, that company level training where the crew's coming together with a, with a clear objective. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Uh, Chief Shaw, thoughts and, and uh, words of wisdom from the great state of Florida so, and all that sunshine behind you. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more, there's enough for everybody to come uh, for everybody. If they want to come down and get some, there's tons of it down here, that and heat. Um, so I'm glad we're talking about this today. And I'm glad to be on the panel with everybody here. And um, thank you for your words in the beginning for, for Chief Halton. I think we're all in, in the same vein thinking of those, those, those thoughts. Um, so let's, let's, yeah, let me, let me just to, to, and again, echoing off the echo in terms of the, the company level training. I mean, it, we could say it's we're blue in the face, but it is the backbone. It is that that crit critical thing that we do at the station levels. And not only 
it allows us to get better at our skills and our craft, but it builds teamwork. It builds trust. It builds camaraderie. That other than running those really significant calls and the calls that, that, that bond us and whatnot, this is the next step. All that training you can do. Um, I remember the training the time I had on ship before I got to days. And I look back at the team that we had built through the years and that teamwork, most of the, a big part of that was the training that we did. It bound us together. It absolutely bound us together. So the things that I was thinking on uh, as we were talking about this right here is first things, uh, first, we're talking about training at the company level um, and the training bureau's role in that. Um, you know, it, it, the training bureau could put out the training that's supposed to be done on a monthly, quarterly, yearly basis, whatever it is. Um, I think assuming it gets done is one of the things that we got to be careful of. Um, is the training bureau providing consistency? Are they providing the information that's out there that is being taught by them to the recruits and, and at the company or at the, uh, the level where they're bringing tr trucks in and whatnot? Um, I know that our, our training division is very good at going over the basics, making sure lines pull, uh, VES operations, ladders, all of those kind of things. They're very good at covering the basics. The basics is what um, we have to be good at. Um, also, it, watch out for the red flag statements. Like in other words, okay, now that you're here, we're gonna teach you the way we do it in the streets, not that the, you learn in the academy. That's always like a red flag uh, statement for us. And I think that we've done really, really well, our training bureau has done really well of narrowing that gap. In other words, what we teach them in the academy, what we teach them when they're rookies, what we teach is very similar to what, or almost exact to what we're seeing out there produced in the field. Granted, like we were just talking about, there's very uh, zone specific, maybe um, training uh, that, that the company office is going to take on their own to really know their first due, which is awesome. But the bottom line is that's a red flag statement. If you hear that that's that usually gives me a moment of pause. Like in other words, let me recheck my train to make sure it actually is what we're supposed to be doing out there in the field. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing. I think that as we start this conversation, and you have to excuse me, I have to jump off in about ten minutes to do a ten a meeting admin life, right? But uh, <laughs> it is it is the backbone. It is so important, and um, I think. I love, and every time Demond gets on and has some words of wisdom, I just like, oh my God, I got to write that down. But I, I think that what I took, took just took from Demond's statement was, what are we training on? Not if. It wasn't an if. It was what are we training on today? And looking back at my 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 career in the field and the teams that were developed, that was very similar to what we did. We we trained every day, and it could have been a five minute drill on a piece of equipment or eight hours out of service at, a, at an acquired structure, but we were doing something every day. It wasn't an option. We were doing something. And that led to consistency, trust, collaboration, camaraderie. It led to all of that. So we talk about these leadership traits that training can, can, can foster. So I'm glad you're starting off this way because it's going to be a good conversation today. So. All right, Jesse, we're going to go to you. So we, we kind of understand it's backbone. We know that. So transitioning now to more of the meat and potatoes for the for the everybody on the call as well as those who are listening in. So what are you thinking when you you know you're the training chief of your department? You put out some training. You're obviously company level. Your company officers are, are developing some training. What are you looking for in that? I mean, how what is that looking like from your perspective as the training officer? Yeah, I think one of the key uh, one of the key things that we're looking for in general has already been touched on a little bit, and that is consistency. So the consistency in the information that's going out, the consistency in the way that that information is being delivered and the consistency in the resources and the accessibility of those resources behind that particular training. So um, the goal is not to have three separate fire departments, right? If you have an A shift, B shift, C shift, or if you're a volunteer <laughs> organization with different platoons and so on, the idea is to, to have one way of doing things. And ideally that way of doing things is representative of, uh, of, of what the crews in the field need and want um, with respect to the, the mission that we face as uh, fire and EMS providers. So with that being said, I, I think the big part behind the consistency is the resource piece. And it's, it's funny because I'm a note taker. Um, so that's why I can't see my hands because I'm busy writing the whole time you guys are talking. So I'm just capturing everything here. And as soon as Chief Heller started talking, it, I started writing stuff down. And coincidentally, they all started with the letter C. But um, one of the things I think we're looking to do is develop information that that um, results in competence, right? And competence is a big part of that. But the second part of that is confidence in getting people to sets and reps um, and maximizing their time spent in training, especially when we have those opportunities, whether it's a hands-on drill, something a little bit more dynamic, 
How do we facilitate that um, as a, a training division or a training person, instructor? So be it to make sure we're bridging that confidence with that competence and then all the things that come along with that. Um, again, back to the that whole C thing, character is a big deal too. And I feel like training appropriately um, can be a good character builder as well, because if we do face those tough uh, times, that adversity during training, I do believe it, it sets us up for success um, on the scene because we're, we're exposing people to that. And there's all kinds of philosophies behind that, such as stress inoculation and so on that help build that um, over time. But the biggest thing I would say is consistency. And I'd say that's probably the biggest thing people are looking for from the training division as well as consistency in the messaging. It, so it's interesting you say the comprehend. I was, I'm writing a piece for a, a friend for something he's doing. And I talked about that, you know, when we do our training, it's just not doing the skill, but actually understanding and comprehending because comprehension will lead to confidence. And so if you comprehend why, you know, and I use the example of forcing a door, why does forcing a door work with a hell and an ax? Not just I can do the skill, but I understand the leverage. I understand why this works like it does. And when you have that comprehension, then people have that confidence that, yeah, I can perform that skill because I understand the, the actual what's going on with it. So, all right, Brian Gettemeyer, Cottable Fire District. What are you doing for high quality company level training with your guys out there? I know you do a lot of training. And so what do you make, what do you, you know, besides the consistency and the comprehension part of it, what are you doing to ensure that the, the training is actually going off and occurring at a high level and, and the comprehension is occurring and, and the guys are actually, you know, getting something out of it. I mean, so, I mean, the advantage as, a, as an engine company captain is it's relevant for us. So we can talk as a company and say, Hey, on this call last week, or I took a class on. So um, a lot of that is being driven by our company uh, about what we want, what we need. Um, you know, our engine company, we're a growing department. So our, our engine company drills over the last couple of years have been, uh, really revolving around new, new hires. So I've had the, the fortune of having a new hire the last couple of years. Um, so that that's really kind of focused us on the basics. Um, so that's kind of where we've been. Uh, um, we're merging this year with some new plans. Uh, just got one of my guys back off of disability for eight months. So uh, we're going to be doing some refresher drills here pretty soon. All right. I'd like to kind of switch gears now because I know we got a lot of a lot of training guys on this call. And I, and one of the things I want to talk about is what's your go-to. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, when I was a captain on the truck, I, I, you know, like most people said here, I like to kind of transition to like, Hey, what do you guys want to do today? What are we going to do for training? And, you know, because they might see something that I didn't see, but on those days where the motivation is not real high, we know we got to do some company training. What's that go-to training that, you know, we could go and, and, and implement today with, without much thought, um, it's been done a million times, but it's a it's a good refreshing skill. And I, I I'll start and, and mine is always that you know that that hand line and just deploying a hand line. I know it sounds so rudimentary, it's so basic, um, and it sounds you know. But I remember uh, working under a captain, and then when I became a captain, working with him at the same station, they pull a line every day. And you know, he says until you can do it in your sleep, which you know we didn't, uh, we will continue to pull lines. And so I always think to myself like. Just the most, you can do it in an apparatus bay when it's 10 degrees outside. You can do it when it's a beautiful day in a park. You can do it at your training tower, you know, but, and you can make it whatever you can, you know, if it's in your app bay, it's a short stretch. If it's, if it's out at the park, it's a long stretch. And so that was always kind of like my go-to of like, Hey, let's pull a line. Let's be proficient at it. Let's deploy it. Let's get it set up for success and let's get it ready to flow. And it engaged the entire company because I had the driver operator pumping water. I had my firefighter deploying. I had me simulating a 360 and coming and backing up with a hand. Line. So, and it only took a half hour by the time we deployed a line and back, you know, got it back in service. Um, so that was my go-to, I guess you'd say. So I guess, you know, a ton of experience on this call. What were your guys' go-tos for, for those trainings? And, 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 and Shaw, if you tell me it's walking on the beach, I'm going to come through this line. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, let me scratch the one off then. Sorry. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> but, but since, but since you, 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 you started, um, I like you, uh, we preach to our cadets as goes the first line. So goes the fire as goes the first line goes. I mean, we preach some of these statements in them so much that it's burned into their brains. I get texts every so often for some of our cadets that have rose the ranks of the Lieutenant and captain that will just randomly they text me. In fact, I got a picture of one that says of that line, you know, the first, it was a meme. 
And it says, as is the first line, so goes the fire. And then his, this narrative was, this is something you used to preach to us that's burned into my brain and I'll never forget it. So I'm, I like you, that's one of my go-tos that, that first line, it, it is so, it's so rudimentary, so basic, but it's so da- da- darn important to maximize that. You, we have to be artists when it comes to that first line. It can't be just something you just pull off and hope it works. It has to be strategically placed. It's, it's not just pulling a line. It's, it's bringing that weapon into destroy the enemy in the proper way. Anyway, but since you already mentioned it, my second favorite thing is the rotary saw, obviously. You know, everybody's got their thing. Some people like extrication. Some people like throwing ladders. Some people like like uh, EMS. Some people like hazmat, which I do as well. I don't know why, but I love the rotary rescue saw. It makes me happy. I love the sparks that fly off cutting doors. It's just amazing. <laughs> but I like it because out of all the things they they expect us to do, we're, we're all hazard response. How can we expect everybody to be an expert on everything? So every time I was working, you know, back when I was in the field, if we had my, my own companies knew how to use it very well. But if people would float in, I would take the time to really go into depth with everything. And then what I was finding is there was little to no education on that topic. So we would go into really down the rabbit hole on everything from the blades, how they're made, how to switch them, uh, saw etiquette, how to hold the saw, what to cut, what not to cut, how to utilize it. Um, and one regret I have, to be quite honest, um, is that especially when I got to training, is that I, I wish I would have had uh, small props developed for every station uh, on the saw, because you could talk about the saws all day. And this goes with a lot of pieces of equipment out there. You could talk about saws all day. You could talk about blades. You can rev it up real quick. You know, you the RPMs go up real fast. It has nothing to do with their knowledge of the saw and how to actually perform with it. So in retrospect, I wish I had produced the smallest training props at our stations for them to at least cut. Because you know our people, they'll they'll go through the, 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 the nuts and bolts. They'll talk about it. The, They'll go through the blades, go through the tactics, strategies, and then they'll have two groups. One group that'll say, okay, we're done. I think we're, we've got enough you know, saw stuff done today. Or the other group that'll go, okay, let's go cut something. And if you don't give them something to cut, they'll find something to cut. So <laughs> trying to provide them something to train on is important. One of my, uh, Mark Rossi, who was on the show a few months ago, actually just developed a prop at his station, and he's going over that a lot these days. But I, I, again, it's one of those things, it's my favorite thing to do because it doesn't get used too often, but I at least want them to have a plan A, and when they use that to look like a professional, you know, hold it this way, make sure you do this, and so on and so forth. So that's what one of my go-to things to use. It, it's, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because, we did saw training on our USAR team and, uh, and everybody was excited because we were going to cut stuff, right? So we all go in this classroom, we cut stuff, there's saws on the tables and we didn't cut anything. We took all the saws apart. We went through everything, reassembling the saws, how to clean the saws. And I mean, you would, you, you know, from, from rescue guys, you can imagine the faces of like, they're looking around for, like you said, the props to cut, like, Hey, we're just going to start using cut. And it was, no, you're going to disassemble this thing. They're like, well, that that's logistics job. Not today, fellas. <laughs> So it's kind of a, it was kind of a fun eight hours of uh, watching people kind of go through this. What about anybody else who also got a great training? Uh, I, I, I tell you, when, you. I, when, when I was riding, I uh, I my go I rode on an engine slash squad. So you know, again, uh, you guys said it as as the first line goes, so goes the fire. Uh, so I was really really kind of just drilled into my brain that we're going to get that line right. And that's going to be a drill. It's going to be a constant drill. And and I had my share of probies come through the house. So for me, I did a lot of two and a half teaching because if if they did well with a two and a half, then inch and three quarter work was not going to be an issue. But if they couldn't get that two and a half right, I, I, I was going to have a problem. I operated in a place that had a lot of commercials that, you know, had the need for the, the ability to use that line. So my goal was they were going to be good with that. So we did a lot of hose pack drills. And again, hose pack drills were easy because we could get it out. So like you said, it's, it's, you know, tomorrow it's supposed to be six degrees here. That's not an excuse not to train. So the engine room floor is fine, right? You can take your hose packs off. If you catch a job in between, it's no big deal, right? Just throw your stuff back in a rig. We haven't even stretched off the rig. So that was an easy drill that kept us in service all the time, but it was a very important drill because we had that ability to get better at something that I felt was a diminishing skill. It just wasn't something we did enough. It's a three quarter pre-connects. We trained on them all the time, but man, if, if I had a crew that couldn't stretch an inch and three quarter pre-connect and I'd been with that crew for a while, it's more than the crew's fault. That's on me. And, and that was never going to happen. They, they knew their stuff and they, 
they drilled it. And a lot of times they would, I'd be out there, I'd be in my office and I'd hear something, you know, couplings hitting the ground. And that's when, you know, you've, you've made it because you made the impact you should have made. But, uh, and then the other thing that, that I developed and I did this years ago before the chiefs told me to was we did bad building drills. So it could be a, you know, a nice sunny June day and our work was done around a firehouse and whatever our drill was, was done. And instead of having to be an assigned building inspections or whatever, we would drive. And I wanted the guys to get time in the rig. I, and, you know, the fuel cost wasn't really a big concern of mine. I wasn't admin. So, uh, um, you know, I wanted them out in the districts, but I didn't want them just out checking out, you know, the girls and guys at the mall. I wanted them doing things that, that were worthwhile. So we, we brought in a, a bad building program. So look in your district, find something that it doesn't have to be dilapidated or falling down, but it could be something that gives you that gut feeling that, like, oh, hell, if that's on fire, that could be real bad. And let's, let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. Put a little lesson plan together, put a PowerPoint together if need be, and bring it back to the other crews. So as, as Jesse said, we don't have A platoon, B platoon, C platoon, D platoon, whatever, all doing it differently. And when, I, when we became the consolidated department, that became a drill that I asked everybody to do. And I put it out through the training division um, because I was then in that position to do so because we had consolidated in one big department. If you were working at engine 19 for your most of your career and now you got assigned over to 14s, it was a good idea that we tell each other what we had because a lot of us had never responded into those areas, not as first do. So what we did every week, each platoon was supposed to send in, uh, send it through the training division, send in a, a, a pretty comprehensive outline of this bad building, whatever it may be. And then through training, I would review it and the training captain would launch it out to everybody as a bad building drill for that week. And it, it really worked out pretty well. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing it, but um, it was just one more thing that it just helped us along. And again, gave us foundational knowledge of the districts. Yeah, it's a long answer, but I think that's, it, it was it was a pretty cool program. I like that. I, the idea of, you know, it's always nice to get out of the building, out of the firehouse, at least. I, I As a company officer, I could stand just sitting, waiting, you know, doing, you know, we were doing trainings and stuff, but it was like, I just want to be outside. I just want to, especially on nice days when it's, the weather's nice. It's like, like you can drive around. I'm thinking, you know, it, it sounds terrible, but how, how, how can you have a bad day when you're in a fire truck driving around? I mean, it just turns your mood better. I mean, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. And, and had I been on assigned to a truck, we would have been out throwing that, that boom and seeing where we could set up and where we couldn't. And yeah, you, know, it, you got to make it to your company and your responsibilities and, and you got to be damn good at it because, and I, and I think Amanda said it best in, in her comment to us, you know, that's where you build the trust in one another. And, uh, and that's, you can do it as multi-companies, you know, engine nine and engine six are going to get together and we're going to do this stretch that we might have in the garden apartment together. And now we can build that camaraderie and that, that, that trust in one another. It, it all goes right to it. it. It all flows. And that, that last comment I'll give you is this for years, we've said you're only as good as your last fire. And it's true. Right. You, yeah. If, if I screwed up my last fire, man, I couldn't wait for the next one where I could get it right. You know, I, I think we could add to that. You're only as good as your last drill rep, too, because if you did a crappy drill and, and we sucked it up and it really wasn't what it should have been. Well, damn, let's fix it. And let's get better at it, because that's what we're going to carry into our next fire or our next run. So. Totally agree. Demond, back. Thoughts? Your go to training? So for me, my go-to training always revolved around hose line deployment and basic ladder evolutions. Once that's my shock space for demand. <laughs> that's heart and essential of what we do as professional firefighters. So you can never get enough of stretching lines and you can never get enough of throwing ladders. Kind of going back to an earlier comment the chief made opening up in regards to its chief officer. So about six or seven months ago, I had the companies come down. We did some basic ladder evolutions at the drill tower, including our 35 and our 40. And I too participated in that training because 
while I have a different title and rank and different set of responsibilities at the end of the day, we're all professional firefighters. And I show up on scene as the incident commander. And if there's grandma, young, uh, young child hanging out that window and there's no one around to assist with the engineer or someone else with throwing that ground ladder, I too need to be competent. So when it comes to company level training, that, those are my two go-tos. Host management, evolutions, and throwing ladders and getting out there into different, different parts of the city, different parts of the district, discussing which line is best, pre-connect or dead low, why, and also interjecting, talking about situations that would dictate an inch and a three quarter versus a two and a quarter versus a two and a half inch hose line. We can never get enough of that. Company officers, you have control over that. Once again, it doesn't cost us anything. And the fire chief, he or she is not going to have an issue with that unless you're tearing something up or being disrespectful <laughs> to um, our residents out there in the community. But how often does that happen? No, I think you're right. I, you know, I think that, and well, actually, that's a, a perfect segue for us is how do we, so we know company levels training is important. We've talked about it being the backbone. We know it's critically uh, a function of what we do, second only probably to uh, calls. So how do we ensure that we allow our companies to have time to get it done? I mean, obviously we know, you know, as, as administration, we have a few administration people on this call, you know, how, how do we ensure that one, they're doing it, but two, that they're not getting bogged down with all the other stuff that's, that we know we have to do, right? Inspections and hydrants and, you know, all the other stuff that, you know, city halls coming down with and stuff like that. But, and then I guess I'd parlay the other part of that is how do we ensure that company level training is meaningful to the firefighter? Meaning not, I think everybody on this call would agree that, Hey, how we put a fire out is important, but we also know that there's a contingency of, of, of thought that that company level training is not going to give me anything that's going to show up on a resume. And so not, and I, 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 I take, I say it's tongue in cheek, but we all know that there's people out there that are like, Hey, I, you know, I, I'm too busy with ropes for rope certification, or I'm too busy with my hazmat certification or my fire officer certification or this certification. I got to work on that stuff rather than this crazy hose thing you're telling me of that I think is on a fire truck. So Brian, how do you chat? How do you face that as a, as a company officer? It's going to be a challenge, especially coming out of COVID and getting all our other responsibilities assigned to us. Um, I'll, I'm going to jump back just a little bit and, and kind of talk about my go-to drill, which kind of can can go into a short segment, which is uh, um, did a piece for Firefighter Nation from 2016 to uh, 18, where we did a line of duty death calendar, and we associated a line of duty death with that particular day. So that was an easy one, and we had the link to this um, to the NIAS report. We had a link to the Firefighter Hero site, so you learned about that firefighter. So that's easy enough for me to sit down in the morning at breakfast or sit down at dinner time and talk about, hey, here's this line of duty death. Um, this is what occurred. Uh, and then here's some growth opportunities that that we may not know of. So that that's an easy drill. Um, if, if the day gets so packed with stuff um, that we didn't have time to pull a hose line or, or do a, a truly hands-on drill at dinner time, just to sit down, just talk just a little bit about an incident. Um, and it gives you a new incident every day. So in those times when you're missing, hey, I, I don't know, it's it's freezing outside. We, we're not pulling a hose line. Um, what are we going to do today? Well, I can just go to line of duty death calendar, pull it up, look at the report real quick, and then take out some nuggets. Um, today's report was a, a, a cell tower collapse. How many of us have, have run a cell tower collapse with a secondary cell tower collapse? That was It's a good little talking point about do we have them? What will we do? Um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, Mikey, this firefighter that was killed in the uh, in the collapse, it was a secondary collapse. Who's thinking of a, a collapse zone of a cell tower uh, while they're rendering aid to a, a victim of the initial collapse? So it, it just gets us a little diversity. And like I said, you can tailor that to a drill and go out and do some skills, or you can narrow it down to, hey, I have 10 minutes at dinner time to talk about it, that, that I can pull that out and, and look at that. So, so Brian, let me ask you this. And so for your firefighters that, cause you guys are a progressive department. So you guys, you guys are doing stuff. You got guys that are trying to get promoted and that sort of stuff. So how do you engage them that, 
the idea that this company level training, not not necessarily the line of duty death, but like your, you know, your basic engine ops, right, truck company functions, when they're essentially chasing, I don't want to say chasing certificates because that's not the right phrase, but you know, how do you find that balance? And then how do you instill in them that this is the foundation upon which you'll build your career? My job as a company officer is easy in this one because I got a I got a crew that loves that that's always looking for that. So so my job right now is a challenge because it's and we're always up for the drill. Uh, like I said, we we've, we've had new guys with us all the time. So we uh, I'm I'm fortunate that members of my companies know, hey, we, we have a responsibility to groom this individual because this is our future. Um, so so that's been easy to this point. Um, we just, we have to make it it's back down to relevance. I have to make it relevant on this is why this is important for us uh, to be good so that when it's time to go, you know, we can perform efficiently. So, so it's, if, if you're in there and you're in the trenches and, and I'm not, you know, going, oh, this is horrible. This got assigned to us. We have to do this. I, I'm, we're excited. Let's make this good. And if it, then maybe it even means amp up the drill a little bit. Hey, they want us to do X, Y, and Z do we want to do a challenge with this? Cause the crew's always up for a challenge. Yeah. We want to make this drill a little bit more challenging. Okay. Let's do that. So, so sometimes we got to, you know, take the bland uh, drill that got assigned to us, spice it up a little bit and, and make it a fun day. Jesse, saw so you coming in there. What are your thoughts? Um, so back to one of your um, other questions in terms of how do we make the best use of that company's time with respect to company level training? I started thinking of a, a few different things. And one is I'm certainly not the most well-read person on this call. That's for sure. But there is a book that I really like. And the book is uh, called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. And he kind of breaks it up into three sections in terms of uh, greatness being grown. So Amanda Miller, uh, was it Amanda Miller? Um, she had a comment earlier in terms of unconscious competency being the ultimate goal, right? That's the end stage of that proficiency or, or what we're trying to shoot for. And there's four phases of competency, starting with unconscious incompetency. We don't even know what we don't know. I don't know how to pull a two and a half inch line. So I don't know what a two and a half inch line is. So I, I think what we can do um, on the training end to make that company level training more manageable to where they, they don't get bogged down is to have our resources organized, right? So uh, the talent code basically breaks it up into three steps, the learning process, ignition, deep practice, and master coaching. So this deep practice part would be our company level training. And one of the, the paradigms of the book is to chunk it up, right? So chunk it up, That phase, those phases of competency aren't covered in 30 minutes. And I think a lot of times we try to make things quantitative versus qualitative when it comes to training. Um, but the reality is, if we can chunk that up and we know that it's a process, and once we develop that unconscious um, competency, our goal is then to maintain it by chunking it up into little pieces, whether it's building construction, whether it's ground ladders, aerial operations, pump operations, our uh, hose line deployment. I think that's where we can um, give those crews a lot of bang for their buck, so to speak. And we don't exact, we don't expect them to go to zero to 100 in, you know, 1.5 hours, we know this is a, a process and we need to build this incrementally over time in a way that they could absorb it. And when you speak about technical rescue, it's hard for me to tie a, a Portuguese bowling or whatever, the, these fancy exotic knots, if I don't know how to tie an overhand knot. So instead of going straight to litter basket operations, maybe we should spend some time on, um, you know, the, the why, when, and how behind all these knots and then we're proficient on that. Then we add the litter basket. Then we add all of these other things into the mix over time to continuously maintain and build on those competencies. No, I like it. I, it, I like the ideas, like I said, the, the unconscious competency, the competent competency, and then the idea of this, this chunking it up because it makes it into, you know, edible pieces, if you will, that we can actually comprehend in the fire service. You know, we'll all learn at different levels. Um, we all, you know, grasp things differently um, through, it, through our learning processes. So breaking it into the finite parts that, you know, we can actually make sure that before we move on uh, with the lesson or the training that it's actually being comprehended by, by the firefighters. That's good stuff. I, I totally agree. Um, 
I was going to say one of the other things I really am a big fan of when it comes to company level training is having the firefighters have a say in it and, and maybe even leading it. And so, you know, we talked about, you know, Amanda's, you know, again, leading by example, um, and, you know, Chief Simmons, you know, last, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, doing the 40 foot ladder raises and things with his department is, you know, sometimes the, the thought is, is the company officer, chief officer, whatever, we have to always be the lead. And that may not sort of be the case, you know, sometimes letting the firefighters lead those trainings or, or, you know, dive in and be, a, be engaged and provide that value back to the team can, can be a win-win for everybody. Any thoughts on that or you guys seen success with that? Yeah, Chief, just adding on to that in terms of allowing firefighters to take the lead on drills. In addition to these young men and women, the ones who are on the front lines, they're the ones that are out there actually engaging in the hands-on activities that we as company officers and definitely as chief officers are rarely doing. You're allowing them to showcase their skills. You're allowing them to build up their confidence. And then also, too, when we talk about succession planning, these same individuals are one day going to be company officers, and they're going to be tasked with overseeing training and education. So it's a benefit across the board. Builds up their confidence, allows them to practice their delivery, practice their skill set, um, application, and then it prepares them for what they're going to be doing later on down the road as, as some company officers in the organization. And it builds that confidence. I read Chief Heller put a comment on here. Oftentimes they're more dialed in. So Chief, kind of go into detail on that. I, I, I kind of think I know where you're going with that, but I'll let you kind of explain that a little bit. Sure, sure. So listen, I operated, I, I worked in a company that uh, we didn't call them squad companies and, and back before, back in the day, and then we created them, but we were a squad company, right? Uh, I was the captain on that company for 20 years. I was by far not the best rope guy. I wasn't even close, like, you know, slip on boots were on there for a reason, right? But I had guys in my company who were outstanding rope guys, right? So I deferred to them. Hey, Sean, what would you like to do this week on, on the sock stuff when I was putting out what we were going to be doing? Because you're, you're, you know it, man. You went to that Sprat class. You know what I should be presenting. You put the class on for us, you know, give us a drill today. Tell me what I'm missing, you know, and I can learn so much from those guys because I'm not a master of every everything that we did. Um, you know, I was I was really dialed into engine and really dialed into extrication. Another guy was really dialed into trench or confined space. So my opinion is our people we're sending. Number one, we're sending them out like, you know, we where I worked, uh, we, we sent a lot of people out to training and I was very proud of that for a long time. I want them to come back with that information and I want to get a return on my investment, right? Because I got to show the bosses uh, over me why I did this. So I want them to come back from FDIC, come back from a Sprat class, you know, come back from, from, you know, extrication fest or whatever the hell it was. And I want them to be able to deliver to us good, competent stuff that we need. And that's why we sent them there. We wanted them to get it, comprehend it and bring it back to us. And, and, and it does give them, I think what Chief Simmons said perfectly, succession planning is something we overlook often. You know, I, I don't wanna, and, and I, know, I know Jesse said the same thing that, you know, sometimes we have to be vulnerable as the leaders, as company officers, chiefs. We have to admit that, you know, there's somebody in a position that's, that's not wearing gold, gold horns yet, but they're really bright and they're the next one to be wearing those gold horns. And, and I see it even more now that I retired, somebody had to take my place. I'm quite confident that guys who I worked with are doing a great job because we talked about that and, and we, we put them in a position to do so. Um, so, so that's kind of where I am on that. The other thing I would caution, I've had officers that want to do things. Let's do a training on this, even though it pertained to nothing we were doing. Or it was they really wanted to focus a lot of time on something that was very, very low frequency, low chance of happening. Not that it wasn't important, but like you said, we only have so many hours in a day. So it's hard to put too, too much into something like that when we know we have other things. We have to be very cautious. We stay away from mission drift. And that is um, I've seen that in a lot of departments where we started to get into that mission drift. and 
And then all of a sudden, well, that was cool. That was the buzzwords or that is something I, I saw somewhere. And hey, we better be prepared for that. And then we focus way too much on it. And the next thing you know, we got away from what our core roots really should be. And again, who makes that decision? Again, I, I think it's the company officers and probably mid-level management and then upwards to the chiefs. So you, you bring that up. It's a great point. So I, I'll tell a story is uh, my current role as assistant chief here. You know, we had a new employee who was relatively new on the organization, been here about three months, new to the fire service, just got to the academy. And so, you know, we in our minds, we all collectively can probably throw together what we think that training plan should look like for that new employee. And so I, I go out to the apparatus bay and, and what do I see the captain and his crew working with his new employee on? But, you know, an MPD rope rescue system. And while, trust me, I, I like the ropes and everything just as much as the next guy, um, that's not what that three-month employee needed. That three-month employee needed basic saws, ladders, hose deployments, right? And I think to your, to you know, to piggyback on what Chief Heller is talking about is, you know, in the fire services, a company officer, we, you know, we sometimes have this 15, 20 years on the job, 10 years on the job, whatever it might be in your department. And so your focus of what you want to focus and do can't be driven by your own personal goals. It has to be driven by what the, what the company needs. And so that, you know, the company training needs to focus on improving the company and what the company needs. And I think that also helps when the company is involved in teaching some of that company training to maybe ground us. Cause you know, I had a conversation with that, with that captain, the captain's not a bad guy. He was a great captain, you know, he, you know, and, and it was just, you know, he didn't see it from that perspective. He's like, well, this is, this is what we need to do. You know, we got these new things. We got to do this. I'm like, but does that firefighter really at this point in his career, you know, yeah, he can tie a knot and set up a three to one in the belay system, but he couldn't deploy a hand line <laughs> to a front door. You know, it's like to your point, which one, which one's more of a priority, right? So, <laughs> so it, it, all good stuff, all good stuff. So thoughts, anybody else on that as we talk about it? Yeah, no, Brian, obviously, Brian, obviously that was a good teaching point that you had with that company officer in regards to relevancy and at an individual's three month tenure in organization, what's more important? Yes, we know we need to be proficient in every piece of equipment tool that's on that apparatus. But at that point, at a three month period, he or she needs a good foundation in those basic part of one and two skills. Absolutely. We've been going about 50 minutes here. I was going to see, uh, give some final thoughts here and wrap this thing up with what you guys kind of give us your nuggets on the company level training and that sort of stuff and uh, kind of wrap up here if you guys are good with that. Jesse, start with you. Jesse's always famous for having the props in the background. He's always got those. Uh, he has some props. Switching up what he's got. Chief Shaw would be happy. We, uh, we did some, some rotary saw training today. So look at that. Some evidence of that. Uh, but I think uh, uh, on my end, too. Jesse might have froze up a little bit on us there. See, he comes back. Demond, what are your thoughts? Final thoughts from, from you. Your final thoughts, folks, is company officers. It's your responsibility to make sure the men and women who are working with you, for you, under you, are competent as it relates to their uh, responsibilities. Most training and education is free, so we have no excuse there. The district belongs to us, and we have, and while some of us may belong to organizations where we don't have a nice fancy training center or a bunch of different props, use what's in your district. Parking lot, in a lot of cases, is suffice. So don't feel that you're limited because you don't have the latest, greatest, biggest training tower, props, and all that good stuff. Be consistent with training and education. We talked about time. Yes, we never know when a 911 call is going to come in. But if you're consistent with every shift at 1,300 hours or 1,400 hours, we're going to go out and do something, then that habit eventually grows and four, five, six months down the road, you realize that it works for you. And last, company officers, keep your firefighters engaged. Allow them to be part of the um, 
discussion on planning as it relates to training and education and let them lead training and education for, you know, from time to time and be creative. Most of the stuff that we can do, once again, doesn't cost us a lot. I keep coming back to keep coming back to that cost factor because we know that oftentimes a lot of organizations that's a limiting factor. But you have fire hose, you have ladders on your engines and trucks. I've never received a, uh, a bill from the water company because we were out flowing water and probably <laughs> never will. So even though I, I, I live in the state that's in a drought right now, no one's ever come to the front door and um, find me or said, stop flowing water. So can't have any excuses. Thank you. I like it. I like it. Jesse, you're back. I am. I make no promises how long it'll last, though. Um, essentially, what I was saying is it's our responsibility to make sure that we can cover everybody, whether they've been in our organization for 25 minutes or 25 years. And that's a good challenge for us. And as you see things um, changing in the workplace, whether it's a generational difference or whether it, or a perceived generational difference, or whether it's a change in our mission, um, it's our job to make sure all that information is relevant. And um, that relevancy piece that's been spoken to already, already, people want to know why they need to know that. And people deserve to know why they need to know that. Um, so I think that's a, a good key for us. I think at the end of the day, we're here not just to build skills, but to build habits. And that's that. That's really what that unconscious competency is, is effective habit building. Because when all else fails, that is what kicks in our, our habits um, versus a, a real cognitive Recollect, recollection of a lecture that I had in 2007, um, you know, at 2 p.m. while I ate a donut or something. It's it's going back to those instincts and those habits. Mm -hmm. and that's really our goal over time is to to facilitate trainings that build good habits. Awesome. Chief Heller, final thoughts? Well, I, I echo what what has been said previously. You know, and and I, I really like. Uh, a lot of, of what was discussed. I do believe the secession planning is important. We have to empower these people that that they have to understand they're next. Be ready to be next up. You know, in, in a war situation when the sergeant got shot and dropped, next man up. And and it's no different in our our job. I, I had a conversation today with Dave Gallagher. He's retired, retired out of Huber Heights, Ohio, and been an FDIC instructor for many, many years. And one of the things that Dave pointed out kind of a difference in generations because Dave's probably a, a group a, a group older than me and then comes me and then comes the next group you know and one of the things Dave said to me is you know when we trained and we were trained we were trained to to fight the fire punch the demon you know in the throat go at it and that was our goal and then everything else got better once we did that and and that level of aggression wasn't it, it was what we did and it's not always what I see today, where now a lot of other aspects are being thought out before the first lines are ever getting stretched, things of that nature. And he said, but man, if you don't go back to those basics, the rescues don't happen. You know, you, you, everybody with the, you know, make the grab, make the grab. And, he, and that's true. If you don't get that first line deployed, if you can't get that, that, a uh, portable ladder to the back of the house where mom's hanging the baby out the window. The rest of it doesn't matter. So it goes to, as, as the said, it goes to relevancy. It goes to the importance of next person up and ready to do the job. And, and it just has to be that way. And that foundation is sure as hell right at that company level, get good as a company, and you're going to just keep improving, improving, improving up the ladder. I, I really, really believe that. And, and I witnessed it in, in my own career. And, and I'm really proud. One of my proudest things as a retired chief is that I don't know the number. I'd have to think about it. But a good number of guys in my fire department today that are captains and battalion chiefs were firemen under me. And to me, that was leaving a bit of a legacy. I might not have done it right. They sometimes you learn as much from a bad leader as a good one. But if nothing else, they learned something, good or bad. They learned what they liked and what they didn't. And and that's what we have to do as company officers and and as good firefighters, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing that. Even if we don't, in, you know, even if they don't plan on testing to be at the next level, 
be prepared to step into that level and, and do what is relevant for your fire department. I, I, you know, I think that, you know, uh, I love that succession planning because I think to your point, we're not good at it in the fire service and too many times guys get squashed, right? Like, Hey, you haven't been here long enough to take that class or you haven't been long. You, you don't know what you're doing. So don't even worry about that. And then that mindset sits in five to seven years and five to seven years in, I mean, you're seeing guys, you know, well, Hey, we got a shortage of people. We don't have anybody that's qualified. We don't have anybody that's ready to take that test. And, you know, so I think that's a hundred percent true. And, and, the, you know, the, uh, I had a Kansas City um, captain once say, you know, it's a fire ground, not a playground. Act like it. You know, it's where we should we, we should be proficient, not acting like fools and trying to, you know, do things that, that don't make sense. So the good stuff. Brian, what are you thinking? What are your final thoughts? Uh, I think the first of all, the, com- the company has to have ownership in the drills. Uh, you know, if we give them ownership in the drills and the direction of the company, uh, they have pride in their work and, and, and drills get done good. Um, and the other thing is, is that we need to uh, have a little bit of fun, make some fun out of the drill or, or make it a competition and, you know, be safe and not not be the playground scenario. But we can go out and pull a hose line and have fun. Uh, we just did throwback drills the other day and we were having a competition on how fast we could make the grabs on our, our targets. It, it made it a fun day. Most of us got in the fire service because, you know, we like riding the big red truck, but we also like to have a little bit of fun. Um you know, and then keep our drills relevant. And then for a company officers like myself, it, it's, you know, I have to be humble at times that that other firefighter may have a, a new perspective of this or uh, the fire service has changed. And some of the stuff that we did when I first started in the 90s is way different now. So so those younger guys adapt a little quicker than, than I have. So uh, um, it is that sometimes I got to turn over the reins to them uh, to bring in a new perspective and then have some ownership. And then ultimately, maybe they're the next company officer. So that grooms them uh, for the future. And, and sometimes when you're standing there uh, conducting the drill the first time, it's a little harder than you think it is. So it, it's a good learning experience for them. So um, that, that's my two cents. No, it's all good stuff. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this hour with everybody. It's been good talking, you know, talking training, uh, talking company level training. And I think we can all agree, you know, we've said it multiple times, but it truly is the foundation and backbone for Successful companies, successful company operations, um, engine ops, truck ops, doesn't really matter. Um, you got to get out there and train with your crews. You're going to reap rewards if you force, which you're not going to force, right? People came to work today to be firefighters. So if you force them to actually get engaged and train, they may not, they may grumble under their breath at first. But, you know, like we said, you create habits out of it and six months in and you let them engage and be part of it, you're going to reap those rewards and you're going to be a successful company. And, you know, you're going to have people want to come to your company because it's where it's at and you're going to be successful on the fire ground and all those things. So it's good stuff. I, I appreciate everybody's time today on this call. I know, uh, you know, we got uh, just a plethora of knowledge here uh, with everybody that's on here. Um, on behalf of the ISFSI, International Society of Fire Service Instructors, I thank uh, Fire Engineering and Clarion again for this opportunity to discuss this. We will be back in April prior to the uh, FDIC at the end of April. So Again, once again, make sure you guys get out there, get registered for FDIC, get your articles in. Uh, like I said, put your thoughts into words, uh, put them down on paper, take some pictures and submit. Uh, you know, you, you never know. You might just find yourself in the magazine or online or, you know, on one of these hump day hangouts with us. So thanks again and uh, everybody stay safe.